So let's start today's talk. Today's speaker is Daniel Douglas at Yale University, and he's going to speak about timers, webs, and local systems. Thanks, Hinq, for the invitation, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, so uh, I haven't been to uh, South Korea, and in particular, any GAP seminar. So the closest I've been to is a GAP seminar in Timisoara, Romania. So hopefully someday I will actually get, get to a GAP seminar in Korea. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, so th thanks again for coming. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about joint work with Rick Kenyon and Helen Shi. Uh, Rick is a professor at Yale, and Helen is uh, currently one of his graduate students here. I'm also here as a postdoc. Um, and uh, this talk is supposed to be uh, pretty elementary, so, so please ask lots of questions. Um, hopefully it will be kind of fun. Um, so, so a dimer, dimer cover of a graph is, is a perfect matching. Uh, so, uh, so I haven't really drawn the graph here, but you should think that there's a, oops, it's kind of, you should think that there's a, graph here. And uh, the dimer cover is, is a subset of edges of the graph uh, such that every vertex is covered and every vertex appears in exactly one edge. Okay. And so you can imagine how historically these things might have arose in, in physics or science, maybe uh, even in even in some of the uh, early in the math papers on dimers, they talk about oh, you know, you have diatomic molecule, the two atoms, and they're kind of so you think about this as a diatomic molecule, or or um, or um, a more interesting, there's something called the the Ising model in statistical mechanics, which basically has to do with um, like you have a magnetic, you have all these you kind of have a bunch of magnetic particles located, um, you know, in, in kind of a lattice maybe, and some, and, and they have spins that are either up or down. Uh, and, um, and they, they, they uh, interact by so-called nearest neighbor interactions. Um, and, and the, uh, the spins kind of their energy wants to be in the same direction. So this is kind of a low energy state and this is a, a higher energy state. And there's a temperature for instance, and, and uh, when you turn the temperature way up, basically it just gets random and scrambled. And if you turn the temperature way down, it kind of takes a direction, you know, all up or all down and the temperature gets really close to zero. But then there's kind of a critical temperature where you, you get these kind of patches, and and it actually turns out to be kind of a uh, uh, kind of like a scale invariant uh, kind of structure. Uh, so uh, invariant of the scale, kind of a fractal -y kind of thing. Um, so anyway, so there's a lot of cool mathematics uh, in this statist statistical mechanics models, and, and dimers are a way that people like to study some of these statistical mechanics models. Um, okay, so uh, so I have to admit, like I, I only really started learning about dimers uh, when I got here. Uh, that's kind of Rick's specialty. I, I uh, of these three words, the things that maybe is closest to me is is the webs. So kind of low, which appear in in low dimensional topology, and in particular in kind of higher technology theory where you're studying SLN uh, and, and kind of geometric structures related to, to the SLN and, and, and surface geometry and topology. Um, and the, the goal is to, to try to, uh, to try to mix, you know, mix, mix things up a little bit. Um, so, okay, that was my little introductory spiel. Um, so now we're gonna get into actual math. Okay, there'll even be some proofs throughout the talk. So let me know if you have any questions about anything. So, so to start, G is just going to be any graph, um, and uh, oh, by the way, is the audio okay? You can hear me clearly. It's not muffled. 
Is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's great. Okay, oh. thank you. Let me know if it either gets muffled or I get like too loud or something. Um, so uh, the, the only constraint I'm gonna say is we're, we're not gonna have any loops, like this is not gonna be allowed, but otherwise any graph you want, okay? So except with uh, an edge that starts and ends at the same vertex. Uh, but it can be non-planar or whatever. Um, and just to have, yeah, okay, good. Um, so maybe just have any, well, we saw we had a graph here, this kind of square grid uh, graph. Another, another fun graph is like the, um, it's too thin. Um, looks like green is gonna be our graphs. Uh, it's something like the, the, the one skeleton of a cube is a fun graph, okay? Um, okay. Um, so, uh, so in a paper by uh, Fra uh, Chris Frazier, Thomas Lamb, and Ian Lay in 19, uh, they define, so, so n, uh, let n be your, your favorite natural number, okay? Uh, n is your uh, favorite natural number. Um, I guess greater than or equal to two. Uh, no, actually we can, we can do, we can do even one. We can do one. Um, so, uh, so, so Fraser Lamb and Lay say a, a n, multi-web, so we're kind of jumping right into N. I'll come back to dimers in a second, but we're just, we're just jumping into the, the definition here. Um, an N multi-web, uh, which we're gonna call M for multi-web, um, is a multi-set, so I have my graph, and an, an N multi-web is a, is a multi-set um, of edges, Uh, of degree n at each vertex, of degree n at each vertex. Uh, so multi-set just means that we can take an edge more than once. Um, so uh, uh, now I didn't practice this, so let's see. The risk of making some kind of mistake here. Uh, uh, so that one's not terribly interesting. Uh, okay, give me one more second. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Okay, I, yeah, let's, uh, <laughs> uh, can we do it? Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. We can go like this, and then like that, and then like this, right? So far so good, and then maybe like this. Does, so every vertex needs to be degree three. Does that work? I think so. Okay. Um, so I've, so here, um, every vertex has three edges and some edge, this is a tripled edge, okay? This is a, a doubled edge. So three, 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 three. Okay, yeah, this is good. So this is an example of a, of a multi-web. Uh, you, um, you start from some fixed green graph and then and then you're building a multi-web out of it inside yeah inside the graph so there's going to be there's going to be lots of these multi-webs sitting inside the graph the graph is fixed okay and so this is an example when n is equal to three because the degree at each vertex is three um but some edges can be counted more than once. They can come with multiplicity. So this is a doubled edge. This is a tripled edge. These are just single edges right here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, let me give more examples. Okay. Um, so actually, well, okay. Let me. This is maybe a bad. It, this example is a little too complicated to start. Let's let's do something simpler, where I just have uh, the grid. Okay, and, and uh, maybe, okay, for this one, I'll, I'll drop and then I'll kind of stop drawing the, the graph. And then we'll do another one. 
this. Move the one. This. Okay, so uh, let's do a, a, a let's do another n equals three example. So, so I just I'm just I'm just forgetting the, the I just don't want to keep drawing the the full graph. It, you have all of the all of the the, the grid here. Um, so, so here's an, here's a another n equals three example. Something that looks like this. So it looks like my multi webs are going to be orange. Uh, Here's a, a multi-web like that. Okay. Um, and uh, so this was for n equals three. And what does an n equals two multi-web look like? That looks like something like this. Uh, here's a n equals two multi-web. So, so for n equals two, every every vertex has degree two, right? Um, so you can either, there's, there's, there's uh, only two possibilities. Either you have kind of a doubled edge like this that kind of isolated by themselves, or you have a loop, okay? Uh, and then when n equals one, so, so definition, uh, oh boy, let's see if I can keep my colors pretty in black here. Um, so, so definition, a dimer cover, a dimer cover for uh, perfect matching uh, for no, pink uh, is a multi web. So, uh, so that would look just something like uh, this. Okay. And another example of a dimer cover was, was up here. Okay. So these these multi webs, these n multi webs generalize uh, dimer covers. All right. Uh, let's um, let's denote by just a little notation. Let's denote by omega n is the set of n multiwebs in the graph G, right? Um, okay, I've given some examples. Okay, so now let's talk about um, colorings of of multiwebs. Okay, so so. Uh, so C. So you fix uh, G and then you think of dimer cover of G? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So every vertex of G is in uh, a dimer. So so this so the whole thing is called a dimer cover, and then the little guys are called dimers. So this is this is a dimer. And and this whole thing is called a dimer cover. Okay. And it's a cover because it covers every vertex of G. All right. Um, okay, so let let C N be uh, some colors one through N. This is N colors, <clears throat> and we're going to think about coloring the edges of the of the of the webs. Um, so, so if you have M. Is a um, is a is a multi web. Then um, let's denote C of. Uh, oh no, sorry. Let me give the words here. Uh, uh, a n edge coloring. N edge coloring. of M assigns, so what is it? It's, 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 it's a little function that assigns a set of K colors 
uh, to each edge of multiplicity k, to each edge of multiplicity k. Uh, so for instance, you know, this edge has multiplicity two, this edge has multiplicity one, this edge has multiplicity three. Um, so it assigns a set of k colors to each edge of multiplicity k such that such that you get um, all uh, uh, you know all n colors uh, sorry such that you get such that you get all n colors at each vertex. So, uh, let me give a bunch of examples. Okay. Um, uh, well, actually, let me give one example, and then and then and then we'll get more examples shortly. So, so for instance, um, this is going to be an example for n equals three. So I have three colors: one, two, three. We usually for for n we think about them as you know RBG red red blue green, but uh, let's just call them one, two, three, and um, and uh, let's see, let's, let's pick a graph. Uh, uh, sorry, let me erase this. So let's say that this is my graph. Perfectly good graph. Um, the graph, by the way, the graph doesn't have to be like regular. I think all the, all the ones I've, well, okay, this one wasn't regular, um, but the, the webs have to be regular, meaning that at, uh, you know they have uh, the same number of edges coming out of every vertex, but the the background graph does not have. To be. So, uh, yeah. uh, but okay, so this is the graph in green, and then here's a oops, here's a a multi web, a three a three multi web, something like this, okay. Um, and then we're supposed to assign a set of two colors to the doubled edge and, and single color to the single edge. So maybe um, maybe the colors we assign are um, purple. And set one, three. Okay, and I would get a different coloring, say, if this were the set two, three, and this were one. Okay, uh, does that does that make sense? What a what a what a coloring is an edge coloring. Okay. Um, so let's define uh, uh, again for 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 uh, multi web. Let's let's count the coloring. So let's define C n of m uh, is the number the number of n edge colors. Okay. So now let's do some more examples. So um, so I just want to emphasize this is a function whose input is a multi web. Okay. It's not. Not the graph. We're not talking about colorings of the graph. We're talking about colorings of the of the webs. Okay. Um, so let's let's get more examples. So, um, uh, let's see. So our graph is going to be. Let's let's make our graph. Uh, this this guy again. Uh, actually, let's, let's do it with four. Maybe let's do it with four like this. This is our graph. G. Um, and, uh, and actually, let's see, am I going to be able to, how quickly, uh, trying to figure out whether I should do a bunch of, let's see if I remember how to, how to do it. So if I, uh, no, that's going to take too much time. Never mind. Um, I'm just going to drop one. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so let's do, let's do an N equals two example, N equals two. So it's a two, it's a two web, and a two web is just like a loop. Okay. So that's a that's a two, that's a two web, a, a two 
multi a two when it when it doesn't have any multiple edges we just call it a two web okay that's a two web and and uh, uh, c two of m is just the number of colorings of that uh, two web in orange which is just two there's two colorings is the one where so when, when n equals two you have you know uh, colors one and two and so i can put one there and two there or i can put two there and one there. so i have two different colors. okay um, so what do you do when you have um a multi-web how do colorings work when you have a multi-web so the same graph these are all going to be in the same graph um, so if i have if i have say this multi-web so again n equals two so it's like a doubled edge um, and then there's only there's only one set of colorings you can put. You can just put the set one two. So in this case, C two of M is equal to one. There's only one uh, coloring of that multi -button. Okay, let's 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 bump it up to uh, let's bump it up to n equals three. So if I have the same same background graph. So let's do all the different uh, things here. So, so I could have um, this and, uh, well, actually, let's just, uh, before I do multi-webs, let's, let's say this, you have this one here. Okay, so now we're doing n equals three. Uh, and so how many, <laughs> And so in this case, uh, how many colorings are there? <laughs> I've been teaching too many undergrads, so I ask a lot of uh, open questions. Kian <laughs> Uh You're really asking. I'm really asking. <laughs> okay, six? Six, thank you. Um, so, okay. Um, like I said, two, I've been uh, you just before this. I did a record. I was zooming with undergraduates, so I'm, I'm in a particular mindset right now. Um, uh, -oh. uh And then, what about if I do this one here? If I do this one. Uh, so, uh, okay, so I can do this. Okay, and. Uh, and let's do it like this. C3 of this is going to be equal to C3 of this guy, where the, the doubled edge goes on the other one, like this. OK. And, uh, and uh, so okay. I, I won't. Uh, uh, so in this case, there's only three. Okay, basically you choose. There's three colors, and you choose the color here, and that determines the set of two colors that go on the other end. So there's three total colorings for here. Um, and lastly, um, oh, we got two more examples. So, uh, oh, three more examples. No, we already did this one. So, uh, so if I do this, uh, boom, 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 boom. And I do say this tripled edge. If I have a tripled edge like that, then again, when you have a tripled edge, all you can do is put the set of three colorings on there. So there's only one coloring of that. And then the last example I want to do is an n equals four example. An n equals four example. So in that case, I have C4 of same graph. But now we're going to have two doubled edges, kind of like this. So you have this one and this one. OK. In this case, there are you know four factorial uh, uh, to start. But then uh, you, know, you, uh, you don't care about the order on either of the doubled edges. So it's four factorial divided by factorial, which is six. Uh, yes. Okay, is everyone happy? Everyone happy? Um, 
So, so that's the, the, the number of colorings of a, of a multi-web in a graph. And, um, and so definition is that the partition function for uh, n multi-web So that's that sounds fancy, um, and the uh, so it's denoted z n d. And the first uh, thing is that it's not a function; it's a number, uh, and it's just uh, so. This is you know kind of the physics uh, words here: partition function, very physicsy. Um, so it's the sum over the multi-webs, the n multi-webs of the um, coloring, number of colorings of that multi-web, okay? Um, so for example, so this is something that like depends on the graph, okay? Um, you fix a graph and then you get, you know, if I, if I really wanted to be, uh, you know, these are the multi-webs in the graph. So, so for instance, uh, if I, um, so if we do an n equals two example, we do an n equals two example. My my graph is the square. Okay. Um, and again, so yeah, it's kind of if you want, this is like a function of the graph. So um, let's get rid of that. So z two d of that graph is going to equal. Well, basically, we're going to have uh, number of two colorings of of the single. Uh, this is called a double dimer cover. So a two multi web. Another name for a two multi web. Another name for a two multi web is a double dimer cover. I'll explain that in a second. But um, anyway, just following the definition, this is the number of colorings of of the, the single double dimer cover plus the number of colorings of this double dimer. Sorry, it's not the single double dimer cover. It's the single double dimer cover that's actually a loop. The other two double dimer covers are these uh, consist of these double edges. Okay, uh, so this is equal to uh, every loop has just two colorings. It's one. It's one. Okay. Uh, so the partition function is like the weighted sum of the multi-webs weighted by the number of colorings. Okay. And um, and uh, there is a natural probability measure, natural probability measure. Um, mu n on the set of n multiwebs uh, by defining the the probability of the multiweb is uh, c n of m number of colorings divided by the the partition function. Um, so. So once again, as an example, um, if you want uh, the probability in our, if this is your graph here, and you want the probability of the of the double dimer cover, that's the whole, just the whole graph, the whole square. Um, this would be two, the number of colors of the loop, divided by four, just calculate. Um, and uh, part of the motivation for this work is to study this measure, study. Um, there's, uh, uh, so, uh, so previously, uh, 
uh, uh, an equal, uh, uh, sorry. N equals one, as, as we'll see in a second, there's a, a lot of work by, for instance, Castellane, uh, the spelling rights, uh, for sure, with the, you know, going back to the 60s, um, when N equals two, um, uh, around, uh, the, around 14 there, there uh, uh, I mean, I think, uh, there, and, uh, and more recently, uh, uh, da, 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 uh, so they're studying the n equals two setting. That's when they're thinking about um, uh, double dimers. Okay. Um, but you know, this is this is in the tens. I, I uh, okay, this is in the last ten years. Um, and for instance, here uh, one of the kind of selling points. Uh, one of the kind of selling points is that. You know, for, for n equals n equals two, uh, you know, n equals one is not terribly exciting topologically speaking, right? Because uh, a one multi-web is just a dimer, and a, and a, di a dimer cover isn't very topologically exciting. But when you do n equals two, you start getting loops, um, and so uh, 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 if you allow me to be a little a little rough here, you know, you can start asking questions like the fault. You can start asking the following kinds of questions. You take in, in the plane, you take uh, some kind of grid like this, a very fine grid, and maybe you uh, maybe you put some punctures uh, in some of the faces, and you you pick a a double dimer cover at random, and what you'll get are you know loops. Uh, Something that might look like this, and uh, and then this one just might go around nice, and then you might get some some doubled edges floating around, but you get a picture like this, and so uh, the the kind of question that that Rick likes to ask is like, fix your favorite uh, kind of topological type, your kind of lamination type, and then if you pick a random double dimer cover, what's the probability? That you're going to get a lamination of a certain topological type, like with respect to those punctures, um, and and so he and Dubeda were studying this question, and and one of the, you know, one of the selling points is that um, in the scaling limit, in the scaling limit, as epsilon goes to zero, uh, so what is epsilon? Epsilon is like the well, the the mesh size, so so you have this. Uh, you have this fine grid. So you take your grid to be finer and finer and finer. And then in the scaling limit where the grid basically becomes the plane, um, uh, the, these, uh, the probabilities converge. Probabilities converge to non-zero numbers. You know, they don't all just go to zero. Uh, and um, and moreover, they're conformally invariant. And moreover, um, are conformally invariant. Uh, so, uh, the kind of rough idea of what that means, conformally invariant, is that um, it if you kind of uh, it doesn't matter which which domain you uh, it doesn't matter. Which which domain in the complex plane you study these probabilities in? Uh, if you if you apply a conformal transformation, kind of keeping the background graph the same, so you fix the square grid in the background, okay? But you kind of look at different dom different domains that are conformally equivalent in the complex plane. You'll get you get the same probabilities in the lab. That's what it means to be conformal. Uh, 
so this is all just a kind of selling points um, to say why people are, this is kind of the deeper stuff, uh, why people are uh, interested in, in these kinds of models. Um, and, and kind of the motivation for wanting to study these, these the, a probability measure defined on these kinds of sets of, of, uh, of double dimer covers or, or, or multi-webs or something like that. Uh, any questions about that? Sorry, that was kind of, uh, I left math, I left kind of rigorous stuff for a second and just wanted to give some motivation. Is that a... Uh, that kind of makes sense? <laughs> All right. Let's go back to uh, concrete things. Uh, let's draw a big, big break here. Uh, but but uh, people are still here, right? I because I haven't heard anyone in a while. King King Q. Just yeah, just this okay. few, few seconds ago, I wasn't hearing what you were saying, but I'm not sure if it's your internet or my internet. Oh, you weren't hearing. How how much weren't you hearing? Um. So I, I heard you were saying the mesh size, but then after that, I didn't hear so much. Hmm. So you were um, saying something uh, just when you were scrolling just a few seconds ago. I didn't yeah, um, okay. Um, well, I hope I hope I didn't lose everyone. Um, do, you do you see me scrolling now? Yeah, I saw you scrolling, but I couldn't hear your voice. Okay, the punchline is that when you take the mesh size goes to zero, uh, things converge and they become conformally invariant. That's, yeah. that's the punchline. Um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, why maybe these things are related to kind of these two dimensional statistical mechanics models and, you know, the word conformal field theory gets thrown around and things like this. Um, okay, um, let's move back to uh, more concrete things, okay? Um, yeah. So, right, so, so we have this, um, so sorry, let me, let me summarize. So we had this G and then we had this, this partition function, uh, kind of the weighted sum of multi-webs. Um, uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, Cast, uh, Castellane and, and Temperley Fisher uh, studied the case n equals one. Uh, so now let's, so in that case, let's call ZD. Um, if, if you just, uh, because a dimer on, only has a single coloring C, uh, when n equals one, a, a, a dimer cover only has a single coloring. And so this is only one color. So ZD just becomes the number of dimer covers of the graph. Um, and, uh, and then so we get uh, Castellane's theorem. So theorem. So, uh, now we're going to restrict the kinds of graphs that we're that we're looking at. But but uh, Castellane and Temperley Fisher. Fisher. You're hearing me okay now, though, right? I, everything's good again. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Thanks. So ZD is just the number of dimer covers. It's the dimer partition function of the graph. And what, what these guys say is that um, we're, we're now going to restrict our graph. So if G is a planar bipartite graph, planar bipartite graph, um, uh, so, so bipartite just means that I have every every black vertex is connected to white vertex and, and vice versa. So an, an example is again that uh, the one skeleton of the cube bipartite. Um, so if G is a planar bipartite graph and uh, and uh, such that the uh, n 
the number of black vertices, the number of white vertices, the number of black vertices, all capital N. The, the lower right corner must be white vertex. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, n is equal to four. Okay. Um, uh, then, um, so that's the hypotheses. So then they say there is a matrix. There is a matrix. Uh, uh, let's call it K in M N was the N by N matrix with coefficients in Z uh, such that you can uh, compute the dimer partition function, the number of dimer covers as a determinant of, of that, so, such that uh, plus or minus N, uh, K is equal to the um, uh, ZD, the number dimer. OK, and uh, uh, basically what K is, K is a kind of a signed adjacency matrix, signed adjacency matrix. Um, so, so what you do is, um, uh, uh, so, so let's talk about the signs. These are called the Castellane signs. Uh, they're signs that you put on the edges of the graph. And, uh, let's see if I can write down the rules. So when, when you're congruent, so, uh, so for all faces, uh, for each face, um, of size, uh, zero, oh, by size, I mean, with, uh, with that many number of edges. Uh, so for each face, uh, uh, what's a good way to say this? For each face with, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm having trouble writing right now. Um, with with e edges, uh, where so this has two edges, four edges, six edges, eight edges. So um, when p is congruent to zero, mod four. So first of all, because the graph is bipartite, every face has a um, even number of edges, okay? And so if P is congruent to zero mod four, you want the, um, right, so we, what we do is we put signs on each edge, put signs on each edge of the graph, on each edge of the graph, and if, if, for a given face with p edges around the boundary of the face, if p is congruent to zero mod four, then the product of the signs uh, uh, should be negative one. And if p is congruent to two mod four, the product of the signs should be plus one. For example, um, uh, for this face here, uh, you can have no signs. Uh, for this space here, three signs is good because their product is negative one. For a, for a hexagon, you're allowed to have, you can have signs as long as you have an even number of signs. Um, and then for the octagon, uh, uh, you need at least one sign. So that would be, okay. That's, a, that's a, what's called a Castellan sign, Castellan sign. And then you use those signs to form kind of the signed adjacency matrix. So, so uh, for instance, uh, let's do a little example here. So if this is my graph, my bipartite graph, um, okay. Um, 
So I need, it's a square, so I need a sign. I need a, oops. Yeah. Let me sign. Um, and then uh, let's say that let's say that these ones are the whites and these ones are the blacks. So, so we're going to build a little matrix here. Uh, so let's see with the adjacency matrix. So on the columns I have the blacks, on the rows I have the whites, and then. Uh, uh, white one to black one prime would be one, but now there's a sign there, so I put a negative one, and then the other ones are all just. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, so in this case, uh, when we compute the determinant of k, uh, or maybe I put a negative on the left hand side, and we what what we get is two, and two is also the number of dimer covers dimer covers of this graph, right? Because I have the I have the dimer covers. I have the dimer covers. Okay, so this is a computation of this is an example of Castellane's theorem that the determinants of the Castellane matrix, this signed adjacency matrix counts the number of dimer covers of the graph. Okay. Does that make sense? So oh, the the choice of sign there are some several choice of signs. Yep, and for uh, uh, for for, for uh, planar graphs, they're all essentially equivalent up to some kind of conjugation by a diagonal matrix or something. Okay. So they have all the same determinant. Yeah, it's you, it's uh, for planar for planar graphs. It's uh, it doesn't matter at all what Castellan sign you choose. You pick your favorite one. Okay. okay? Um, and that, and, and if, if, if it, if it, if it helps you, it doesn't help me much, but, uh, but, uh, I've heard it said that, uh, th this choice of castle and sign is something like, uh, like if you're on a surface, like a graph, it's something like choosing a spin structure on, on the graph, if that helps you or, or not. Um, okay. Anyway, so the, the point is, the point is, is that when you compute the determinant, you get signs from the permutations and, and, and the Castellan sign on these edges are, are specially designed so that they kind of cancel out with the signs and the determinant and everything becomes coherent and gets counted with the same sign globally. Okay, that's kind of the, that's kind of the point. Okay, but it's a non-trivial theorem. It, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, really, it's really kind of, uh, you know, the proofs, the proofs are non-trivial. Um, and they're, you know, it's really a planar fact that, the fact that you count these things with a coherent sign globally is really a planar uh, a result about the, the topology of the plane. Okay. All right. Um, so I realized that I, I, I keep saying double dimer, but I never, uh, I never actually uh, explained that. So, so let me, let me, uh, so, so, you know, uh, so, Okay, so we want to now talk about Castellane matrices for um, for n for any n, not just n equals one. Okay, um, but we'll start with uh, well, yeah. Okay, but before we do that, let me just give a, a remark. So 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 uh, so recall that um, z n d is the sum over n multi webs of the number of colorings of the of the multi web. Okay, um, and so here's a little proposition. Here's a little proposition that z n d is just z d d n. So, so z d is just the number of dimer covers. So, uh, uh, okay, and uh, um, the proof is is uh, more or less a, a one liner. So um, you have a map from uh, the set of dimer covers to the uh, nth power, so the, the nth power of this, or product of this set. So we're going to define a map to the set of n multiwebs, which just says um, uh, uh, 
so it takes an ordered it takes an ordered uh, n tuple of dimer covers, so d1, d2, dot dot dot, di, and then dot dot dot, dn. And so we think about this di. We think about this as the dimer color uh, dimer cover of color i. That's how we think about it. And what we do is we just um, we just overlay the dimer covers, overlay the dimer covers, and then we forget the colors. Um, uh, so, uh, so as an example, uh, uh, when n equals two, uh, you might uh, you have these two slots. Maybe this is like red and this is uh, green. Okay. And then if we have our favorite graph here, um, we have our favorite square graph. Um, uh, and actually, let's 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 add just a little edge just to, to make something clear. And then so I have I have this double dimer. So I have this two multi-web rather. I have this two multi-web um, in the graph. Let's call this M. This is a two multi-web. And and what this what this map says is it says I can I can basically uh, take the oh green is not good is it let's go blue okay. let's do let's do um, I can take this this ordered pair of dimers like this and I overlay them. I overlay them and I forget the color and I get my orange. I overlay them and I forget the color and I get my orange, right? And similarly, I can I can take this ordered pair of dimer covers and overlay them and I get the orange, right? And you see basically the, the reason why we think about the the i dimer as with color i is, is because, so we have this map now uh, from dimer covers to the n to uh, omega n, and the point is that the fiber of m, the size of that fiber is exactly, and if I, I construction, uh, the number of, of n edge coloring. Okay, so that's the, that's the proof. Okay, um, because, uh, you know, this, this set just uh, has uh, z d to the n elements, so we kind of uh, partition it in, in that way. Okay, uh, and this is this is why they're called double dimer covers. Uh, so so a double a double dimer cover is like a pair of dimers like this, and you overlay them, and you forget the colors. You forget the order in which you overlay them, and you get this two multiple. Okay, uh, okay so that's uh, you know you can compute the n dimer partition function just completely in terms of the number of dimer covers by this, this little proposition here. And the reason why uh, I went through that is the next statement here. So, uh, pop, 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 pop. okay, okay. So, so what have we done? We showed that for, for single dimer covers, there's a matrix whose determinant counts ZD, the number of dimer covers. So let's show by by this proposition here, let's show that there's a matrix whose determinant counts the, the number or, or the, part, the partition function for n dimers. So, so corollary of what we're doing is that, uh, and this is valid for n equals n, any n is also elementary. It just says that, uh, you know, same hypotheses as Castellane. And it says that, that you know there exists a matrix K, and now K is in um, uh, so remember that capital N is like the number of blacks, which is equal to the number of whites, and little n is our um, you know our like n colors. Okay. Um, there's a matrix like this. Uh, 
such that determinant of k is the n dimer partition function. Okay. Um, and uh, okay. And 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 what all you do the proof is is uh, so all you do is plug in the n by n identity matrix let's call it i n into the kind of n equals one Castellan matrix. So if you want, let me call this k n, okay, to distinguish it from what was called k above. Um, so here, k, and and then uh, so so in our in our example, for instance, above I had the matrix minus one 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 one, and for n equals two, uh, for that same example here, with the Castellane sign like this. I would have the matrix K2 equals, well, before it was minus one, 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 one. Now what it's gonna be, is it's gonna be minus one, zero, zero, minus one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one. Uh, and so because, because you're just plugging in like a diagonal matrix, what you can uh, convince yourself is, is that um, by this definition, the determinant of K to the N is just equal to the determinant of k to the power n. And by Castellane theorem, uh, this is zd to the n. And by the, the little elementary proposition, we just proved that's the n dimer partition function. OK. OK. So. So to summarize, kind of, uh, if we want to count the the, the, the multiwebs, uh, we can we, we we can compute the partition function by determinant of of matrices. Okay, the cost is that they're weighted by these uh, color. Okay. Okay. So what was the whole point of that? Um, well, let's see. Oh. Any questions before I move on? I'm going to start talking about connection, SL, SLN connections now. Any questions before I start talking about SLN connections? Okay, so uh, so so the 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 kind of strategy that people like uh, Kenyan or Dubeda uh, used the strategy is so remember we have this probability measure on the on the set of n multiwebs and the strategy is to kind of probe this measure probe this measure by imposing um not imposing is not the right word by um uh, uh by putting uh, SLN connections on on the graph. Kind of the moral is that here what we did is we took we took the, the n equals one Castle matrix and we plugged in for every one that we saw we plugged in the identity matrix. The identity matrix is in SLN. Okay, the n by n identity matrix is in SLN. And so what we what we want to do is we basically want to Instead of just putting only the identity matrix, we want to put any matrix A in um, So, that, that's the idea. And, 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 and so the hope is that then you have a whole moduli space, say, of kind of connections on the graph. And, and maybe, maybe if you go back to this problem where you're kind of uh, putting punctures in the plane, you can talk about the, like the moduli space of flat SLN connections, and, and then you can start bringing in some ideas from low dimensional uh, topology. That's kind of the, the, the strategy or the goal. You want to bring some of these ideas from low dimensional geometry and topology to study these uh, combinatorial. Um, 
So what's an SLN connection? Um, and so we've got uh, 30 minutes, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, good. So I think uh, uh, last chance for questions before I give the SLN connection, since we do have some time. So it's, it's not for studying SLN connections. It's for studying the, the measure that you talked about and you use the SLN connections. Yeah, the SLN connections are a tool to study this probability measure. Okay. I mean, yeah, ho hopefully I, um, the, you know, the, the probability measure is defined only, it's a completely classical thing, right? Like it's like you just, you have the graph and you just, you just have this partition function which counts these, these webs weighted by their colorings and, and that's it basically. Okay. And, and, uh, and then the idea is to then kind of impose, well actually, so, so the, the, the punchline is that Castellane's theorem has an analog for when you have a connection and, and because of that, because uh, the, the, because the Castellane's theorem generalizes to the setting of, of, of uh, connections, that's kind of why it can be used as a tool. Um, but, and, and I'll make that more precise in just a moment. Okay, so, so uh, it's a, a definition. So what's the, what's the connection here? So, so again, let's, let's say that G is bipartite. We don't technically need to be planar byte net right now, but that's what I have in my mind, but let's just say it's bipartite. And um, so an SLN connection um, on G uh, is basically, uh, basically a matrix that you associate to edges. You associate a matrix to every edge, um, but you think about your edges as oriented from black to white. So you put, you put a, for every oriented edge from black to white, you have a matrix in SLN. So this is B, this is W, and uh, technically, or like I don't really need this arrow there, right? It's uh, for, for, you have a natural orientation from black to white, and then if you go the other way around, you just take the inverse of the matrix. So if you go from white to black, then you take the, oh, sorry. Go from white to black, this is equal to um, by black to white. Okay, so in practice, it's just you put a matrix in SLN on every edge. That's what it is. Um, it kind of, you know, you, you think about at every vertex, a copy of, of C to the N or R to the N or whatever your favorite uh, field is. And, uh, and then you're thinking about these matrices as kind of giving linear maps, okay? Um, okay, so that's an SLN connection on a graph. Okay. So, uh, so, so remark is that SL1 connections are not very interesting. <laughs> Uh, okay, maybe that's not fair. I mean, the point is that then you're just uh, you're just putting the number one, and so you end up just studying dimers anyway. So maybe instead of saying it's not interesting, it's uh, you know this is uh, already studied by Castellane. Uh, so so the first interesting case is kind of any. which also happens to be the case where we get topology for the, we get more interesting topology, right? We get the loops because we have, we're thinking about double dimer covers, overlaying two dimer covers and getting these, these loops, okay? Um, you know, something like, uh, where was that picture? Like this. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard this called a loop soup. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, uh, so, okay, so, so the N of SLN, that's the same N as 
the end before? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, just like just like how um, for this result, the the we were computing this the weighted sum of n multiwebs, right? Uh, this weighted sum of n multiwebs by this determinant of this matrix. In this matrix, we are plugging in n by n identity matrices, right? So that's this is the first indication that they're the same n. OK. OK. Like here is two by two identity matrices for for n equals two. Okay. Oh, and by yeah, and and uh, if you if you compute the determ, I, I forgot to say, but if you compute the determinant of i, uh, you should get you should get four, which was uh, what we got. Uh, one, one also two squared. Four was what we got for the partition function for, um, where was it? It was right here. Four was what we got for the partition function of the, of the just the square graph for n equals two. All right. Um, right, so, so SLN connection, we're just sticking, we're, pick, we're fixing n and we're just putting a matrix in SLN on every edge of the graph. That's all we're doing. Um, and then, what this allows, so the phi is a SLN connection. Then just as before, I can define a matrix in, uh, now it's in uh, M N N of C, not necessarily integer values, but, but depending on the, the connection where it's by the same procedure, so just like here, what I did was I stuck, I plugged in the, the n by n identity matrix into the ones. Well, now what we do is maybe I should maybe I should do it. Like um, if I have if I have something like this, A, B, C, D, uh, maybe like this, and then I have a cast lane sign somewhere right there. Then, then uh, k phi is just going to be, um, and then I gotta gotta do my uh, like that one two my two prime. It's just going to be um, whatever it is. Uh, gotta do that again. Minus a b d c. Okay, so this in this example, these these A B C Ds themselves are you know two by two matrices. So thank you. In M two. Oh my gosh, C. Right. Uh, so this thing here in total. Oh sorry, this would be like for n equals two. Um, so this thing in total would be an M four. Okay, makes sense. Uh, okay, so, uh, so theorem n equals two uh, opinion uh, uh, fourteen, and for the general n, this is our joint work. says that um, plus or minus the determinant of the castle matrix when you plug in the SLN connection is equal to the sum over the n multiwebs of what's called the trace with respect to the connection of the multiweb. Um, so, uh, so this is, so I'll say the words again. This is the trace of M with respect to uh, connection phi. 
Um, uh, so in particular, uh, so remark, uh, uh, so, so when phi, when phi is the, so I haven't defined this trace yet. Um, and, uh, okay. Um, but when phi is the identity matrix or the identity connection, let's, let me use the, sorry, when phi is the, the identity connection, then, uh, let's call it I then trace with respect to i of m uh, is equal to, uh, ah, and when g is planar, when g is planar. So this is, this is a, uh, this is in some sense the key, the key lemma that, that makes everything work. Um, so when g is planar, oh, I didn't say that, did I? g is supposed to be planar, yeah, g planar, g planar by part type. So when G is planar um, and you take the identity connection, the trace of the identity connection, sorry, the trace of M with respect to the identity connection is uh, just the number of uh, N colors. Number of N colors. Um, so the, so it recovers, and, and that's, because of that, the, this recovers this uh, corollary up here, okay, where the corollary basically we were plugging, we were using the identity connection and we were getting the determinant. Um, and and that, so uh, the next, let me talk about uh, Rick's, uh, uh, Rick's version, in the n equals two version. Um, so there, the trace is also what you expect. So, so uh, with n equals two, uh, what is the trace phi of m? Is that um, well, if if m is uh, just a uh, a doubled edge, if m is just a doubled edge, then um, uh, that, that has a, a matrix A on it. Remember, A is in SL2. Um, then the trace uh, phi of M is just the determinant of A, which is a little weight. So, so uh, doubled edges count with a weight one. Uh, okay. Um, or more interestingly, so don't don't get hung up on the double edges. So more interestingly, if I have say suppose I have an M that looks like this, a two, uh, you know the, the one of the one of the guiding slogans is a loop is nothing more than a two web, right? So um, so uh, uh, so consider I have a loop like this. Okay, and I put, um, and I have this, I have an SL2 connection. So I have like an A, B, C, F. Uh, so that's my phi, my phi. Then the, the trace with respect to phi of this loop is just what you expect it to be. It's the trace of the monodromy of the connection around the loop. Um, so it's the trace of uh, and then you have to figure out whether you go right or left, which is always a, a bit of a nightmare. But let me try. So let's go D inverse. Uh, so I'm thinking in my mind, I'm thinking of going around this. Backwise, D, E, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, this is not important at all. Um, this, the, which one gets the inverse, but I think it's this, D inverse E, because we think about uh, oriented from black to white. So D inverse E, F inverse uh, A, D inverse 
C. Um, but now, uh, um, the point is, is that SL2, you know, we notice that I chose, I chose an orientation around the loop to compute that, right? And, and when I just have this two web here, when I have this two web, there's no, there's no preferred orientation around this two web. So here I just made a choice, um, but I, I also could have done, I could have gone the other way uh, and done, uh, let's see if I go around this way, and done uh, D C inverse B A inverse F E inverse. I could have done that way. Um, and uh, but if A, but, but so here we use the property of SL two that if A is an SL two, the trace of A is a trace. And so in fact. Um, both of these give the same answer independent of which orientation you choose. Okay. So, so that's what I mean by for n equals two, that's what I mean by the trace of the of the multiweb with respect to the connection. Um, the multiweb for n equals two just looks like a bunch of loops, okay? Um, and doubled edges. And uh, you um, the, the trace of that thing is just going to be the product of the traces of all the individual components um, via this formula, just by the usual trace of the module. Okay, that was that was uh, Rick's theorem that that the determinant of the 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 Castellan matrix evaluated on the connection counts um, uh, loop uh, double dimer covers. When when n equals two, you get the double dimer covers. Uh, uh, the determinant counts the double dimer covers weighted by their, their traces with respect to the connection. And so, so what we did is we generalized the result to SLN connections where we're now for, for, for n equals n, for n equals n, um, trace of, uh, phi of m is, is called the web trace. So it's the, it's the web trace. Uh, um, of M with respect to the connection phi. Maybe you have, uh, you know, one one of the one of these guys that kind of looks like this might be your uh, this might be your web something that looks like this. Um, uh, and in this. Uh, so you should think about it as some kind of generalization of this kind of the usual trace for going around loops. Um, and, uh, and, and so the, the definition, so, so let me just say some words. I, I don't know if I'm gonna have, uh, I'm gonna really go through the definition or anything, but, but this is a kind of well, uh, a well-studied thing, <laughs> well-studied uh, trace. Um, at the, at the, I, you know, uh, the very latest, at the very latest, there's a particularly uh, clear paper of uh, Shakura from 01 that relates, that, that talks about these web traces and connects them to the SLN scan algebras, uh, SLN scan relations, and uh, SLN character varieties. Um, but uh, the definition, I'm I'm pretty sure it. You know, this is kind of at the very latest. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure the physicists have been doing this for a long time. People have been telling me that physicists talk about things called spin networks that uh, that this is related to. And uh, you kind of do the obvious thing. You you kind of what you do is you you do a you you basically do a a state sum formula. Basically, do a state sum formula where um, uh, phi kind of gives you locally uh, a bunch of tensors, a bunch of tensors associated to the, the white and black vertices and trace phi of m is the contraction of these 
since. Um, uh, uh, the most interesting thing is that these local tensors have kind of a, a determinant feel to them. You, you sum over the symmetric group and there's, there's the signs of the permutations. And so, so the, in some sense, one of the most interesting parts of the story are the, are the horrible signs that, that you know, cause your nightmare every day of your life, um, are these, these horrible signs. Um, but just, you know, one, one of the morals of, the, of Castellane's theorem is that, you know, when you're in the plane, the signs, they all line up, right? They all line up and they're coherent. And that's why you have this, this nice uh, Castellane theorem that, um, that, that the determinant counts, it's actually counting something like as a positive sum. It's not, there's no interference. Um, and, and so for instance, I mentioned how um, in some sense, the, just to give you another indication that uh, the signs are, are uh, a, a, a deeper part of the story. Um, I mentioned that when you when you have, when you take phi to be the identity connection, the trace just gives you what before we were calling just the number of n edge colors, and this is not a priori obvious. Um, so what you, what you do know is that trace of the identity connection of M is a sign sum. It's a sign sum of n edge colors. And so the challenge was to show that um, these signs are coherent. And to do so, we actually used the theorem of Thurston, believe it or not. So theorem of Thurston. Uh, so th this is kind of the, the proof in quotes that there's a theorem of Thurston that says that um, that any two dimer covers, any two dimer covers uh, in, in, in the plane can be related by a sequence of so-called face moves. Um, so what these face moves look like is you you have your graph and and the graph you know, it's a bunch of faces and, and everything is nice and simple because it's planar, right? Um, and so, so what a face move is, is, uh, is you, you have, uh, is on a given face, you have maybe a dimers that go like that and then they, they all rotate by a, by a slot. They rotate by a slot. And so there's a, there's a, a paper of Thurston about a Conway pilings, uh, and, and, and he, 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 he shows that in, uh, maybe you have to assume it's a bipartite graph, uh, bipartite graph, safe. Um, but he shows that any two dimer coverings on a bipartite planar graph are related by a sequence of these face moves. And, and so that kind of let us get control over the signs. But I'm just trying to give you an indication that, that we're using, uh, there, there's some non-trivial mathematics here. Uh, it, it's kind of difficult to go from what is just by the definition of sign sum to an actual coherent sum that counts all of the colorings with the same sign. And, and that's kind of the key to, to making the signs work out. Just like Castellane's theorem had to you know, he had to come up with these Castellane signs and then show that the Castellane signs, you know, conspired with the determinant signs to, to give everything in one coherent sign. So that's kind of, uh, kind of that. And we, we have a little, um, we have a little uh, uh, application. You know, we wanted to study this probability measure. So it, it turns out it's a little easier to think about things when n is equal to three. And so we have a little application on the annulus. If you're interested in taking a look, uh, where we we kind of base we kind of uh, we put a we put a graph on the annulus, and uh, and we study the the kind of the, the question is like choose a random uh, triple dimer cover, three dimer covers. When you when you overlay three dimer covers on each other, right? You get these webs, right? Um, and, and, and think about uh, 
think about the probability think, think about the probability that that say for instance in the annulus you know if you take the annulus and you have kind of this kind of a fine graph in the annulus fine fine graph like this and if you choose if you choose a, a web if you choose a triple dimer cover at random you know it might give you and, and, and it turns out you can use what are called the skein relations to resolve the webs into um, into a bunch of loops, okay? And you might ask, like, what's the probability that when I choose a random triple dimer cover that I get, you know, two loops going this way and one loop going this way? And, and this is the kind of, we, we did a little example uh, computing some probabilities. And, uh, and, and, and uh, it, it's also true that that uh, when you take the limit as the mesh size goes to zero, that um, for the annulus with this little example, you get the probabilities converge um, to, to something that's conformally invariant in, in the sense that um, uh, in, in the limit, it only depends on what's called the, the conformal modulus of the annulus. So it only depends on uh, basically the, the ratio of the outer radius to the inner. Anyway, I think that's a good place to stop. Thanks for uh, coming and, and your attention.